Welcome everybody, uh, despite this, you know, early, not that early, but for those of you who were in uh, CSH yesterday night, I mean, I guess the, the night was a bit longer uh, than usual. So I'm very pleased anyway to, to, to welcome you all here and to chair the, this session uh, uh, that, uh, uh, of Thierry Verdier. And Thierry Verdier is, uh, I guess, a well-known uh, person. He's the, I would say, the prototype of a successful, uh, you know, fellow in France, you know, he has done all of the major grade school, Ecole Polytechnique, and then Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées, where he's, a, you know, a, an engineer of the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées in the grand tradition, the French tradition of uh, Dupuis and Divisa and all of these famous uh, so-called French, uh, you know, uh, engineer, economic engineer. And uh, so he has done, you know, he has worked on a many, many, many topics, uh, uh, including uh, I.O., uh, international uh, trade, uh, contract theory. He has uh, written, uh, I count only in English, uh, 65 papers in major, you know, journals since uh, the end of his uh, thesis in the early uh, 90s. He did his dissertation under the supervision of Roger Guénery, another, you know, famous name in this French tradition. And, you know, among all of the, of the work that, uh, that uh, Thierry has done, I mean, one of them, at least, uh, I know a little bit, at least I've heard Thierry at least once or twice talk about that, deals with, uh, you know, the phenomenon of cultural transmission. And he has written a lot of uh, work on this with Alberto Bissin from New York. And this, you know, in this um, kind of uh, uh, approach, there are many, many models in which we can explain cultural transmission. Some of them are evolutionary. Uh, so Thierry has developed a particular approach by which the transmission is done by the parent. And I think this research is very, very important. And I would say uh, everywhere, but also I think in, uh, in India, I mean, as you, even the current situation, you know, through cultural the transmission, we can explain how, you know, identity is, uh, transmitted and why certain group, you know, uh, uh, feel, you know, uh, in this way to transmit their cultural trait to their children and maintain identity, which can create division. So these are highly important questions. And so I was very pleased to see that indeed uh, these two authors are, are there on this, uh, on this uh, presentation that uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to to listen, and I'll, I'm also pleased that, you know, this was the occasion for Thierry to come back to India. Thierry has been to India, he told me, uh, 30 years ago as a backpacker, so now he's coming as a, you know, as a keynote lecturer, so that's a big, you know, <laughs> a big, uh, big thing, and so uh, I'm very happy that he accepted the invitation, and I will give uh, to him the floor right now with these words. Thank you very much, Thierry, for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, um, thank very much the, the organizers, and uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to be here. And that's true that actually I, I came here into India uh, about something like 30 years ago and as a backpacker. And I, when I actually, I spent two, two times in India. Uh, it was in 1986 and, uh, and 87, where uh, first time I went to the north of India, and then I went to the south of India. And actually, India has a special uh, meaning to me because First of all, I have some uh, very old origin from India. My grand-grandmother on the mother, my mother's side is from India. And um, yes, <laughs> that's OK. Uh, and uh, as well, I, uh, I, I discovered India when I was, I was, I already saw, said that, but uh, when I was traveling backpack on my, my bus all over India and the countryside, and I, I was at the time as a civil engineer, a civil engineer, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I was hesitating between anthropology, civil engineering, and uh, in economics, eventually. And at some point, I, I got through this, this book. I remember that I went to Connaught Place, and I went into a bookstore somewhere. And I bought this book. I mean, I didn't know about anything about economics at the time. I bought this book of Pranab Barden, which was this, this book on, on, uh, on rural economics, uh, where there was contract theory, and there was labor markets, and intelligent markets, credit markets, and all those things. And, and that was the first time I was sort of touched by the fact that you could basically do, do some maths, do some, some kind of formal analysis of social, social phenomena. And when I was on my bus going through India, I was 
I could look on the countryside and when I was stopped in villages and see and look at the people and whether that they was fitting basically with what were the different chapters of the book on in terms of landlords and workers and whether those guys were having uh, fertilizer subsidies at the same time that they were interlinked with credit markets or they had to pay wages in this way or this way. So that, that, that fascinated me and then I decided yes, I need to do something else in civil engineering. So I switched from civil engineering to, to think about social sciences and then I, I decided to go to economics rather than anthropology because, well, at some point I'm uh, coming back to the anthropology because I could really talk about culture. But, uh, but I, I decided to go to economics rather than anthropology because anthropologists, they are very tough guys. They spend a lot of their work and their lives in the countryside with the people and, uh, and they do field, field, field work. And I tried myself to go to, to, South, to Central Africa and I tried to figure out how to live with the pygmies and basically, I lost 10 kilos in 10 days. So I realized that asymptotically, I would probably lose all my weight if I was doing a dissertation in anthropology. So I shifted to armchair economics. So that's why uh, I'm going to talk today about something that relates to, to, to uh, somehow cultural institutions. And, um, and well, this work, this, li this line of research is a line of research that we started some time ago with Alberto, uh, which is based on some of our previous work and, and other work as well that I'll try to, to discuss here. So uh, essentially, the, the basic motivation for this paper comes from a, a basic question in economics, of course, which is how to explain uh, the, level of, the level of development and what are the, the factors that can explain development and prosperity. And among the factors, of course, as economists, we all know that there are some different types of factors that can explain growth and development. Some of them are called proximate causes, and we know much of them about savings, investment, investment in human capital, in innovation, technology, and so forth. And there are also other, other factors that we are sort of, Darren Simoglu calls uh, deep, deep factors of development. Those factors that are sort of more persistent, uh, maybe changing more slowly, and, 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 where, uh, and where we try to understand where they come from and how they affect development. Now, one of the questions, of course, that comes up in the literature understanding the, the role of deep factors for development is, is whether or not one of them is, is basically explaining a lot of the, 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 the growth variation that we observe across countries in the world. And, and among the factors that, of course, are the main candidates that people have in mind, uh, two of them come up. I mean, there's a third one, which is geography. But geography, people most of the time think it's mostly exogenous. Although, as a civil engineer, I will say that there's a part of it that is probably endogenous as well, when you think about infrastructures and stuff like this. But, I mean, the two deep factors that tend to be sort of discussed much in the literature are, are institutions and culture. And uh, when we think about, of course, institutions and culture, those are concepts that we would like for us to define if we want to operationalize them in terms of uh, theoretical and empirical work. And for institutions, there's quite a, a consensus among economists what we mean by institutions. Uh, here I just put the, 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 the definition by Douglas, Douglas North, which is uh, the rules and procedures and other types of human devices that constrain individual behavior and allow people to coordinate their expectations on, on particular types of collective behaviors. Uh, now for culture, uh, and that's why probably economists have a harder time and they started to invest into that particular area later than other, other social scientists, a culture is a much more loosely defined concept. And even anthropologists themselves disagree on how to define culture. Here I just put uh, this quote, I mean, it's coming from two major uh, American anthropologists, uh, Alfred Kroeber and Clyde Kluckhorn, who were students of Franz Boas. And they tried to figure out how many definitions of culture there was in anthropology. And they're figuring out that there was 164 uh, definitions of culture. And each anthropologist basically has his own definition of culture which of course for the economists is kind of a bit of a worrying because which one do we take? Now, um, beyond anthropologists, you have other, sort of surprisingly, people that define culture in a precise way, very precise way, and those guys are biologists, also so biologists. And those people, essentially, what they think about culture, culture, in any case, is some kind of a transfer of information that goes across generations through mechanisms that are beyond genetic channels. So, Anything which relates to transmitting particular information that is useful as a, as a phenotype, as a, a way of expressing behavior uh, across, across generations, it doesn't go through genetic, so not vertical transmission, but everything that goes through oblique, horizontal, um, and eventually um, other kinds of mechanisms that allow uh, information to be transmitted across individuals that are not genetically related can be defined as being 
a part of cultural transmission and therefore part of culture. And they define that as, well, they have genes on genetics, so they have deems and memes, uh, uh, whatever the, the denomination is, uh, on cultural transmission. And this is the way they tend to differentiate who are the type of animals that are purely sort of merely driven by their behavior by genetic kind of uh, mechanisms, uh, and, or those animals that have some elements of, of culture. And of course, uh, socioanthropologists and uh, evolutionary anthropologists and, and sociobiologists uh, they, 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 have, they agree that there are a lot of animals that have some, some sense of culture beyond human beings. Okay. <clears throat> but here, as, as, as an economist, I will, I will tend to take the definition of culture that is coming from uh, Giesel, Sapienza, and Zingales, which basically captures some of those elements of, of, of the, the sociobiologists and the biologists, but, uh, but nevertheless, the text uh, that doesn't, doesn't look so much at the genetic part. Uh, which is a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and beliefs that depend upon the capacity of learning and transmitting knowledge across uh, succeeding generations. So there is really this, behind this the idea that there is transmission of information across generations, and also that this transmission process is not an individual mechanism whereby which you acquire information, but it's social learning. So you have to acquire information from individuals who are not uh, basically yourself. So it's not only through, it's not through experiments or through through individual uh, uh, learning that you, you, you have a cultural transmission. It has to go through, through, through other, other, other um, social learning, through groups, actually, in a sense. So now, given this, uh, of course, as economists, we'd like to identify causality running from factors to outcomes. And essentially, of course, we, we, we agree that institutions matter for development. And this is something that I don't need to, to argue about. And there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of literature that tries to identify this causality running from institution to development. Uh, typically, the way it is, it is mostly done is by trying to identify somewhere in the world uh, a natural uh, historical experiment uh, by which some kinds of institutions can be varied across geographical units or places uh, that share otherwise very common uh, characteristics, such as geographic characteristics or, or culture or other social economic determinants of economic prosperities, and therefore trying to figure out how one type of place where it's subject to this particular treatment of institutions there, uh, has different outcomes than another con uh, connected place, which uh, is, is exactly the same in terms of other characteristics, but just varies in terms of institutions. And there are, there are a lot of examples here. You know all of them, of course that relate to the impact of particular types of institutions on, on economic outcomes and long-term long economic outcomes. Now, uh, similarly for culture, uh, we know that the same type of argument can be applied. And again, a bunch of uh, examples in the literature, and it's still going up, uh, trying to uh, identify how particular kinds of cultural traits matter for, for economic performances or, or, or long-term growth. Uh, it started, of course, with the, the whole idea from uh, socio economic, um, historical sociology of, of Max Weber and other, Mike Klosky recently, uh, uh, on, on the spirit of capitalism and, and, and different other dimensions related to um, religious characteristics. Uh, and, and then, of course, a bunch of economists kept on going, trying to analyze particular dimensions of, of culture and how they might have implications for growth using more or less the same kind of methods, uh, looking for natural experiments uh, locally, eventually using some cross-country uh, regressions, which of course right now are not, not any more popular, but uh, trying to emphasize this idea that uh, cultural traits might matter for, for growth. Now, of course, we know as well that this is not the end of the story because there's a lot of questions on how to identify those relationships. In particular, there is, of course, the question of reverse causality, uh, whether for institutions or culture, for institutions, a typical example comes from political theory where Lipset's modernization theory suggests that when you develop along the development process, you change your political institutions. Uh, similarly, uh, we know that maybe development or economic outcomes can affect uh, the dynamics of, of culture or the way we perceive things as a worldview. Uh, the paper by Giugano and Spilimbergo suggests actually that when you get socialized in an environment in which uh, at the time of your teenager, you are uh, bearing a crisis, an economic crisis around you, you're more likely to, to be risk averse or to, to have a discount factor, which is uh, much higher than if you, are, you were socialized at a different moment of time or at a different period. 
So uh, we have those reverse causality effects, and therefore it's always a matter of taste and, and, uh, and difficulty to understand which one uh, basically tells us the, the true identification. So here in this, in this project, uh, we, we won't talk about this. Uh, we try to figure out, shift the focus away from, from causation uh, to growth or economic performance to the question of the interaction between those two factors, culture and institutions, because we think that uh, the identification here always may be particularly clean in one particular example, but always deals with issues that are, you know, measurement errors of your factor that you measure much, much uh, earlier compared to your outcome and or uh, some, some long-term persistent other dimension that is not controlled for, which might affect this identification relationship. So here we will be more like looking at this interaction between institutions and culture, and, and, and then therefore trying to figure the, uh, discuss more this, this issue of, of the, um, this joint interaction and their implications for, uh, for the dynamics and the mechanism by which they interact. Now, uh, there is, as well, up to now, quite a number of papers and literature on, on, this, uh, on, the, on the analysis of this uh, coevolution between culture and institutions. Here I mentioned some of them, not necessarily all of them. Uh, there is, the, of course, the recent empirical survey by, by Alberto and, and, and uh, Paola, uh, which uh, summarizes much of this, of this literature, uh, in particular the empirical side of it. Uh, but you have here a number of examples that relate to one particular institution and one particular cultural trait and how they interact. And typically, uh, what comes up from all those different kind of specific settings is that you have sometimes the relationship which, is, which I call a kind of complementarity by which a particular institutions tend to promote the diffusion of a cultural trait in a society that reinforces the smooth functioning of that institution. For instance, if you think about legal systems and norms of cooperation by, by Guido, or city-state in Italy and civic capital, or uh, uh, city-states and generalized morality in Europe versus clans and restricted morality in China uh, with Grafe and Tabellini, uh, or political institutions and political culture and democratization and civic culture, for instance. Uh, I have a paper with two coffers on that and, 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 and team. Um, and, and Torsten as well. Uh, so many examples suggest that you may have this relationship, which is a positive relationship between one particular institution and one cultural trait. Uh, but you have also maybe sometimes the opposite kind of relationship where uh, the institutional setup develops, uh, promotes the diffusion of a trait that is counterproductive for the institution itself with a negative feedback. For instance, uh, the examples that is often mentioned is the, is the work by Isaac Lindbeck and, and other Swedish economists that suggest that, well, uh, the development of welfare state institutions and transfers, which were probably very adapted in the context where the work ethic is high, at the same time uh, developed a, a, a promotion of a, a decreased transmission of that work ethic characteristic, which in a turn, in turn uh, makes the system of the welfare state less sustainable in the long run. So it's a kind of a situation of, of, of stability. Another example is the paper by, um, by, by those four guys together in Econometrica, where they, they suggest that when you look at the Cuba Kingdom, uh, which is a very which was highly centralized state in, in Africa, uh, pre-colonial pre state in Africa, uh, the norm of, 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 of rule following and obedi obedience or uh, uh, was sort of uh, undermined, undermining or undermined by the, the structure of the state, which was more centralized, more centralization at the state level was tending to make people less likely to, 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 to keep on having a, a, room, a norm of, of following uh, the, the right thing. Uh, independently from, from uh, having the, the state support. So you have different examples here that suggest that you may have sometimes complementarity, sometimes you may have susceptibilities, and all those examples are specific cases. So what we wanted to do here in this work is to, is to, is to try to, feed, to have a more, sort of more general setup, but at the same time pretty tractable. So that's why the title of this paper, uh, we put simple models, a uh, tractable uh, framework, that would, that would try to capture different types of situations. And we would like to have this framework to be tractable enough that eventually taking one particular example, another example that we have in mind in terms of one institution and one cultural trait, we could uh, try to analyze that 
in this, the, same, the same setup, or at least provide the methodology how to analyze that in the same setup. Okay? So of course, this is not an easy problem because we have to deal with two, two variables, which are what I will call culture, and another one which I will call like uh, some, some parameters or parameter describing institutions, which in a sense, by the nature of those two elements, are, are, are state variables. So they have to move over time in a sort of slow moving way or there's some degree maybe of persistence, and therefore in how they interact with each other. Now, uh, what we, we try to capture in this framework are basically three, three elements. The, the, the first one is that we, we, will, we will sort of be inspired by the literature of institution and institutional change. Think about the Simogu and Robinson uh, democratization model or, or Bessley and Pearson type of state capacity investment model uh, by which uh, essentially you think that institutions reflect the, the, the relative political structure, uh, political power of different groups in a society. Okay? And, and, and of course this particular political structure affects the types of policies that are decided in the policy game between the government and civil society. And we, we view institutional change then as a kind of mechanism that uh, will internalize some of the, of the problems that are associated with this policy game. In particular, the problems that might be associated with those policy games are commitment problems or externality problems or any kind of distortions that are not internalized in the interaction between the, the central power that reflects the structure of power or, uh, of, of, the, of different groups and, and the interaction with, with the private sector or civil society at large. Okay? So institutional change will be a mechanism that, in a sense, will allow, if the current structure of institutions or the current structure of political power is not adapted in terms of the outcome, even from the point of view of that current structure of political power, they would like eventually to change it by changing the institutional setup uh, uh, by democratizing, for instance, or by allowing certain groups to have more voice uh, in order to, to make it like uh, you change the policy game's outcome in the end. And, uh, and of course, we take here for granted something that is relatively uh, accepted in literature, that institutions, uh, when you do that, what I call like uh, some kind of de jure kind of power structure, uh, has, some, has some degree of commitment. So that otherwise, of course, there's no reason why you would want to do that. But uh, because you cannot commit necessarily on policies, but you can commit somehow on the structure by which you make decisions on policies, on decision rights on policies, rather than the policies themselves, then in that case, by changing the structure of decision rights on policies through institutional setup, you might be able to, to have institutional change that allow the end up situation to be better. Okay? So in a sense, the model I'm going to have here in terms of institutional change is very much inspired in the same way as the William Sionen type of view on whether you want to allocate residual decision rights inside the firm to particular parties, you want to do that to, to basically make sure that the guy that, are, that is the residual claimant gets the, the higher uh, power in terms of decision rights, right? So in a sense, we'll have something in analogy, analogy to that when we look at the process by which institutions might be changed over time. The second feature is, of course, that comes from our previous work with Alberto, the fact that the policy game outcome depends on the profile of values or preferences or, or norms that exist in society. And this, in turn, is reflected, reflecting, of course, the, the cultural context in which those decisions are taken. And therefore, uh, this kind of structure of values and profiles of preferences can evolve over time according to uh, cultural transmission that is de de determined by, by socioeconomic incentives of parents or other groups or institutions to transmit particular trait to future generations. Okay? And then, of course, we take those two blocks together and look at how they interdependent, uh, uh, where they, how they, how they, 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 they co-evolve together uh, and their interdependence. And, when is it that actually they, they tend to reinforce each other or situations in which they might go the opposite way, okay? So this is basically what, what the paper is about. And what do we get out of this? Uh, well, we get a number of features. Uh, the first one is that, of course, we, uh, we have a model where we have different types of dynamics and in which we emphasize certain things that are pretty much emphasized by economic historians like the role of initial conditions, the fact that we have non-ergotic dynamics, we have oscillations, eventually non-monotony changes in preferences and institutional change patterns, and eventually sometimes, in some cooked examples, cycles. Uh, essentially, what that suggests is that you have very strongly non-linear type of interactions 
And as a matter of fact, from an empirical perspective, when you think about looking at, let's say, some health outcome today and regress that on uh, something like the uh, Mita system in Peru 200 years ago, 300 years ago, basically you do what you do is what economic historians uh, main, criticize as a compression of time, compression of history. Because essentially what you do, you say, okay, something here moves up and down. Let me look at how it moves up and down there. But in the middle, you don't know what happens. It could go like this. It could go monotonically. It could go decreasing or whatever. And that, that of course, is the whole process by which you have some kind of historical process going on. And maybe you might say, well, at the end of the day, I matter only about the final outcomes. But it's not so clear that from the point of view of intertemporal welfare or for societies in terms of normative aspects, this is necessarily the best, the best path that you, you might imagine to compare to the actual situation, right? So somehow this feature that you may have some kind of non-monotonic dynamics of interactions between culture and institutions is something that, that connects better to what economic historians have in mind in terms of the way those things tend to evolve. Now, at the same time, uh, we could also do some comparative dynamics. And if actually in the paper, uh, we, we define what we call cultural and institutional multipliers. Namely, when you have some kind of exogenous shock, you think about your natural experiment somewhere, uh, whether on the institutional side or on the cultural side, and you figure out what will be sort of the final outcomes of this, when institution and culture co-evolve, obviously, the final outcome that you could estimate will be very different than if they, you think them as being independent from each other or one being very sluggish and the other one being very fast. Uh, and in that case, you may have some kind of positive cultural multipliers or institutional multipliers or negative, depending on this degree of stability versus complementarities. And finally, also, I think that what is interesting about the setup I'm going to describe is at a very elementary level, uh, an example of something that connects to two literatures when you think about institutional dynamics and cultural dynamics. One view, which is essentially the view expanded by Daron and, and, and our co-authors, uh, of which I actually at some point, at some point I, I was part of, or I'm still part of, uh, is that we view institutional change as very much something in the Bicarian way as being goal-oriented, designed purposely by some kind of specific agent that understands fully what's going to happen in the future, and therefore, in a centrally, central fashion, somehow, design the institutions to make sure that those things happen the way it thinks it's best for itself. So there's a kind of a goal purposive view of uh, evolution, uh, of changes of, of, those, of this variable, okay? At the same time, you have also another view about, about changes in institutions or changes in, in here, it's going to be in culture, which is evolutionary change. That is, it comes up as an emergent property of decentralized decisions among agents and some kind of selection mechanisms that, of course, has been very much inspired by, by biology processes. Uh, so here we're going to have the interaction between both. Somehow at one level, you're going to have a hierarchical structure, centralized structure that's going to decide over time how to change somehow progressively the structure of de jure power uh, of groups and at an underlying level, at the level of civil society, you're going to have a trait that's going to be transmitted uh, in a decentralized fashion, and that will be selected by, by mechanisms that are very much akin to uh, sociobiology mechanisms, but in a context which is a social, social transmission. Uh, and then we have a bunch of examples uh, where we try to apply this setup to particular cases that relate to typically uh, still valid examples of social interactions when you think about redistribution, extractive institutions versus inclusive institutions and, and redistribution, uh, public good provision, different types of externalities, think about uh, global warming and the green culture, or, in, uh, and, or also, of course, examples related to, to growth and development, occupational choices, uh, investment or corporation. So, but I will, I will not have time much to go through the examples. Uh, I will describe just one, one example, basically. So, now, the, the, the model will have two blocks. One, which is about describing how we view institutional change, and one block is going to be about how we view cultural change, right? So, for institutional change, essentially, we're going to have a very simple sort of mechanism design approach by which we will say, okay, institutions are designed to resolve a commitment or an internalization problem associated to a particular policy, policy choice. 
And, and the way this is going to be designed is by the current structure of institutions. So let's suppose you have a parliament with a number, of, a number of different rules by which you make policies. You decide about policies, right? And those different rules involve committees and, and, and different types of procedures, agenda setting of different types of people and groups that are involved in how do you agree on the decision-making process of particular policy on the budget or taxes or redistribution or whatever. Now, uh, you might want to do at some point some institutional reform by which you change those rules. You allow some groups to be better represented, having more voice or more power in the decision-making process. How do you do that? Well, the, what we, we take a view here is that the current structure of power decides about the next current structure of power. So in a sense, they're going to have an, an incentive to uh, to change eventually if that, from their own point of view, from the filter of their own sort of uh, interest, they, have a, they, they, they realize that maybe changing that may improve on uh, the, the, the outcome for themselves, okay? And that, that, that will involve the trade-off between, on one side, a cost, which is that if you change the de jure structure of power, that means that you give to other people more decision rights on policies rather than to yourself. So that's a cost to you because, of course, those people will tend to bias the decision-making process more in their interest than in yours. At the same time, you have a gain because, in a way, that's a mechanism by which you can commit to better policies that will resolve your internalization problem or your commitment problem. So it's really about the same as saying, well, why is it that actually we have the independence of central banks uh, in mon on monetary policy? It's because actually and we have a conservative central bankers. is because, essentially, uh, we, we commit ourselves not to, to use inflation ex post uh, to, to resolve our, our budget deficits, right? And, and ex ante, therefore, that affects the, the expectations on investment and so forth. So that may be a better outcome for a particular government to, to just give the decision rights to another group. Now, we're going to have a principle here that suggests that to whom you, will get, you want to increase the, the, the decision rights on policies. And essentially, what will come up is very much in the same way as from Williamson. You will want to give more power to the groups that are more likely, by their own choices of policies, to resolve the internalization of your problem in the beginning. I mean, if you have a commitment problem or an externality that is not taken care of adequately by the policy game that I'm going to describe, then you will try to figure out which kind of group will want a policy that gets closer to resolve that kind of, 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 of distortion. And then, naturally, uh, you will tend to increase the weight of those people in the decision make the collective decision making process okay so what we come up with this kind of mechanism is that on one hand because this is the current structure of political weights that's going to define the virtuous structure of political weights we're going to get naturally some kind of institutional persistence right so you're going to get some state variable in a sense uh, at the same time because the policy game outcome depends on the profile of values or preferences or whatever determines the motivations of people in society, uh, the, 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 cultural, the distribution of cultural traits in society that determines somehow those behaviors have implications for the, the, the extent to which you want to resolve your internalization problem and therefore on institutional change. So this is how culture will matter for institutional change. Now, the second block about cultural change, which basically says, okay, we have a process of intergenerational cultural transmission in the standard way that we described with Alberto for some time, and that will generate endogenously a mechanism of cultural selection, and, and that's going to depend on, 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 on two things. First, of course, on the, the current structure of, of trait of the population, because you inherit that from, partly from your parents, and therefore the current structure of, of population in terms of cult cultural traits will have an effect on the future one, so that creates some degree of persistence. At the same time, because it's going to be determined by some incentives of parents or other groups to, to, to influence who gets what in terms of cultural traits. Uh, the, uh, there will be some kind of effects of what they think that will have an, as, an, as an implication for, for their kids or for the people you want to socialize. And therefore, uh, policy outcomes that have an effect on allocation of resources will in turn indirectly impact on the mechanisms by which particular cultural traits will be more or less selected in the dynamics of population in the society, okay? So that's how institutions and the policy outcomes they imply will affect the process by which you have cultural change in the population, okay? All right, so now, how long do I have still? Yeah. Okay, so uh, 
I'm going to go first with, very quickly uh, yeah, uh, through an abstract kind of policy making setup where I will describe what comes up in terms of social dynamics for fixed cultural distributions. What happens then when you bring cultural dynamics into the context, the, the core evolution of the two, and then examples to conclusions. Okay? Now, so the general setup is, is very abstract. So uh, there are, of course, in many, many critics that you can do on it. Uh, the, we're going to get a society with a different number of groups. And those groups are characterized by different characteristics, whether on preferences, which of course relate to their cultural traits, uh, resources, technologies, and so forth. Okay? And essentially, I will say that a particular agent in group I will, will make an action, AI, and you have this vector of actions in society. Okay? And you, you have a vector, but in most examples, I will. Uh, we have in the paper, it's of course it's unidimensional because it's much simpler, uh, of economic policies, P, that is going to be decided by in a centralized fashion in the policy game I'm going to describe. Now, agents have indirect utility functions or objective functions that depend on their own actions, the vector of policies, some aggregator of all the actions in the society, that could be the average or the sum or whatever, uh, and of course, the, the uh, profile of, of cultural traits that is reflected here by a vector of frequencies of different cultural traits, one to n. Okay? Where, okay, so that's what I have to say. Now, there's a game. Uh, in, in a given generation, there's a game between a centralized institution, which is kind of a policymaker, it is represented by a policymaker, that's going to choose the, 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 the policy vector. Uh, and his objective function will reflect the structure of power where, of the different groups, and the different groups are basically, their power are reflected by their weight in the objective function of the policymaker. Beta i will be the weight of, uh, of group i, okay? And, and so you have a policy game in which you have a standard Nash equilibrium by which the policymaker chooses uh, the policy vector, the individuals take the policy vector, uh, taken as given the actions of the civil society, or the private sector, and the private sector or civil society takes their own actions, uh, given the actions of the others, and given the, the, the policy vector. Okay? Out of which, conceptually, you end up with a, a Nash equilibrium in terms of policies and, and behaviors. Okay? So, no, you don't have unique, well, you have uniqueness if you impose enough, enough concavity conditions and and, and that's, that's what, otherwise you would need to have on top of that uh, some, some selection mechanism. So that, that, of course, tells us that we avoid to, well, we, when we think about institutions here, those are institutions that relate to, uh, to, to uh, issues of uh, distributive conflicts somehow, right? Or, or probably good provision. We are not looking at the, the specific role of institutions as coordinating mechanisms, which is another dimension that is, can be investigated. Uh, and that relates exactly to the selection mechanism by which particular types of Nash equilibria will be, will be chosen. So we will assume that there's a unique Nash equilibrium to make our things nice. Uh, now, so there, there's going to be what we call here a societal equilibrium that for given weight uh, will be the Nash equilibrium of that policy game, okay, at a given point of time. And, and so that's going to be maxima, that's still going to be the solution of this problem, which is that the policymaker maximizes on P, taken as given A, and the A maximizes U, given P, and the other A's, okay? Fine. And so do you have at the end this societal equilibrium that depends on the structure of power in society beta and the, the, the distribution of traits Q in the society, and as well for the policy, the policy vector, and payoffs for different groups. All right. Now, how do we change institutions here? As you can see, of course, as we have the Nash equilibrium, there's basic inefficiency, which is that actually the policymaker doesn't internalize the effect of his policy choices on individual behaviors, and that can create some, some distortions. And therefore, there, there might be some scoop here for trying to change the outcome from the point of view even of the current institutional setup. So what we assume here is that the current institutional setup, with their own weights, they decide the setup for the next period, beta t plus 1 by institutional design, okay? Uh, and then that happens again and again and again, but we make a drastic simplification because if we were doing that correctly, 
we will need to say, okay, this guy, when he decides it's beta t plus 1, understand that this guy decides it's beta t plus 1, we understand this guy decides it's beta t plus 3, and so forth. So we'll have an inter intergenerational kind of game structure across policymakers. Uh, if we didn't have this part of the model, uh, we couldn't think about doing that. Uh, and if you impose enough concavity on your policy functions, uh, we know that there's a solution to that problem. But here, as we're going to bring on top of that culture, we're going to simplify dramatically this part of the problem by saying that you design your institutions thinking that it's going to be the ones that are going to be permanently in place forever. So you are myopic in that sense, and it's just one period ahead. You could do it two periods ahead and then say it's myopic forever. Uh, that, that changes a bit of the, the structure because it brings an interesting insight, which is uh, you want to prevent to go on the slippery slope, which is that if I change, I give power to you today, and I know that tomorrow you give power to somebody else after tomorrow, uh, then, and this, this somebody else, you don't like it at all, then you may be stuck in not giving power to somebody who today you would like to give power to because you understand those dynamics. So that kind of mechanism is not, is not taken into account in this particular, in this particular setup, but uh, that could be partly extended uh, to some extent. Okay, so here you have the policy game, given the particular structure of society in terms of cultural distribution, and that decides therefore the policies and the actions, and you have this beta t, and that's, that's what we're gonna have here, and of course we're gonna have the other part here for cultural transmission afterwards. All right, so what is the way you're gonna decide your next period or forever uh, change in, in political weights? Beta t plus one when you are a guy with beta t. So essentially what you're gonna do, you're gonna look at well, given your own weight, so your own structure of power, what would be the outcome of having a different structure of power in terms of the policy game that you play here, right? And, 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 and to solve that problem, so basically you want to determine the beta t plus one as a function of the beta t. Now, this is a kind of, already it's not an easy problem in most cases, but there's a particular situation in which you might, you might be able to, 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 to have a, a very easy characteristic which is essentially you have to do that by introducing another concept, which is what we call here a societal commitment equilibrium, which is basically the Stackerberg leader solution of the previous policy game, by which the policymaker now plays as a Stackerberg leader and decides the policy vector, taking into account the reaction of society to that vector, okay? So in that case, you internalize exactly the effect of your action on the society. And that gives you, again, that... that when this problem is concave, that gives you a unique solution, which is a sort of what we call a societal commitment equilibrium that, the, that therefore depends on the action, uh, the policy that will be maximizing this under internalization, what we call PCOM, and, and the consequent actions of society. Right. Now, this problem, therefore, can be analyzed given that additional concept, which basically tells us that the beta t plus 1 that you're going to choose will be satisfying this equation. Meaning, by this, that if I were a guy of structure beta t, I will prefer, of course, I know that given my own structure of beta t and the structure of the policy game, what's going to be implemented is going to be p of this. But why I would prefer, of course, above this is this p com. Why? Because I'm internalizing some of the externalities and therefore I'm improving on my, on my welfare, right? So now the question is, how can I make sure that I get close as, as, as much as I can to this PCOM by changing the weights of the next policymaker? And the way to do that is, if I change the weights of the next policymaker to beta t plus 1, this guy will implement P of beta t plus 1, QT plus 1. Sorry, what's the plus 1? Is the of next generation? Now, yes, in a, in a complete model, that will be this. Uh, here we make it even simpler. We make sure that we will, again, be myopic to be consistent that this is going to be QT, basically. Or we make time go to continuous time so that, basically, that doesn't change that much. But if it's QT, then why would beta evolve? Beta will evolve because there's a discrepancy between P and PCOM. Because your PCOM... Sorry, sorry, P I just want to... Uh, PCOM, PCOM is... Is, is this. PCOM is basically what comes up from the solution of the stackerberg nash equilibrium, by which you internalize the action. So essentially, think about the case where you have taxation. The policy game, you tax without taking into account the distortion that you tax in, as on the incentives of people. 
in the, poly, in the Stackelberg leader game, you, inter, you internalize the effect of your taxes on the behavior of people. So you basically take into account that effect. Now, uh, as a policymaker, and if I cannot commit to tax in a certain way, I will want to delegate my decision rights to another policymaker that may internalize better than I do those distortions. And that's exactly what happens here. So essentially, what you will do is you want to make this guy beta t plus 1. This guy, will, you know that when he plays his own game, he's going to implement this function p. But what you want to make sure is that this function p is as close as possible, and in that case, it's going to be equal to your best function from your point of view, if you were able to internalize the uh, distortions and, and externalities, OK? So this p comes. So that generates somehow a dynamics of, even if q doesn't change, of beta. Beta t plus 1 is a function of beta. And what you want to do is to uh, basically uh, delegate to next period's institutions a better choice. And if you can't get to that equality, you get as close as possible to that equality, OK, in terms of the policy or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the utilities. So intuitively, what happens here is that the current institutions, they design the future institutions in a way to solve their own commitment policy problem by delegation. So they change the decision rights of who decides what in the society in, in the aggregate. And, and what you get out of this, of course, you, have, you are moving towards constraint efficiency gains over time. The institution will convert towards that up to the moment at which eventually you might get stopped because uh, the policy vector is not enough to give you further gains. Uh, and so it's basically a model of optimal delegation in which you generate, you give the residual decision rights to the groups that are more likely to internalize your uh, political externalities that at the current period you are not able to internalize, okay? So for two groups, which is what most of the examples are about, and for, it's gonna be a unidimensional dimension change on beta, and, and when the, the vector is itself just one dimensional, in terms of the policy games at the end, and that it satisfies some monotonicity assumptions on beta, then you can basically describe completely this, uh, this dynamics. And the steady states will be just the zero of this object in terms of beta. So if you want to see it more clearly, suppose you have, in terms of, you have just beta. So you have two groups. So this is beta one, the weight of beta of the group one, and the policy vector that comes up from the Nash equilibrium has this shape right? Somehow. And it's monotonically increasing. Uh, now, and the, the other one has this shape, right? So now what you see, the institutions with this weight at time t, they would like to have this outcome at their policy game. But they can't. What they get, they get this, actually. So because they want to have this in terms of uh, our policy outcomes, but they get this, what they will do is to delegate the weight. They will reduce their own weight, beta 1 to beta 1 t plus 1, to make sure that actually the policy uh, vector of the next period is exactly playing their best, their best policy. And then that goes on like this, and eventually when they cross, you get to the steady state. If they don't cross, you get to corners, or 0 or 1, okay? In the case of one dimension. Now, the cultural dimension part, uh, okay, will be a model where this is standard in terms of Bizin Verdier which is essentially transmission of values, parents and society matters. So parents socialize their kids, uh, they, they, they make some effort, the kids can be socialized by the parents. If they are not socialized by the parents, they look outside, they are socialized by society, by picking a role model in the population of different traits that exist in society. And you have some evolutionary dynamics, and it's basically a model that is very much inspired by Cavalli, Sforza, Feldman, and Boyd and Richardson, but where the rate of transmission is endogenous and determined by incentives of parents to transmit their traits. So this is what you get at the end, some kind of like very much like a replicator dynamic equation, uh, where the replicator, the, the, the fitness function somehow in the replicator dynamics now are sort of the relative rate of success of transmission of one family against another type of family, where those rate of success depend themselves on the optimization uh, of socialization processes by families. D is the rate of success of socialization of family I to his own type. And DJ is to the type of family of type J, to his own type J, okay? So essentially, we have a model that looks like this with two traits. Parents 
directly socialize the kids to their own trait. If they don't succeed, the kid picks up a rubric model, and, and, and that's what the trait is given in terms of, of the values. Here, that the particular case, you have two traits. This is an equation for any, any number of traits. Uh, here, this is for whatever the number of traits. That's the general equation. Uh, those socialization rates here of families, they depend, of course, on some socialization mechanism by which parents, they want to be transmitting their traits to their kids. Why so? Because parents are paternalistic. If parents are paternalistic and partially altruistic, they like to see their kids like them doing things. And if the kids doesn't do things like them, this is a cost to them. So they prefer to bias the process in their direction. And therefore, if you solve the model with socialization and optimization of social, on socialization on this DI, on the problem for the parents, you have at equilibrium that this socialization rate depends on two things. How the parent himself figure out what will happen if he doesn't socialize the kid to his own trait and the kid is socialized by society. Society meaning all the other trait models that can be uh, transmitted to the kid. So that's why it depends on Q, the, the population of traits at the point of time where parents socialize. This is the external environment uh, of cult the cultural environment in which the, the parents react in order to make sure that their kid gets socialized. And it depends, of course, on the paternalistic motive for parents to socialize their kids. And this paternalistic motive depends on how they feel that their kid will do in a given context with a particular policy, so a particular institution, a particular cultural structure uh, in terms of policy outcomes, um, if they were themselves and if they were somebody else, meaning uh, another group, right? And in that case, it's going to depend, therefore, on that paternalistic motive. So in, in a two-trait two model, that, that's pretty uh, easy to characterize, and it gives us an equation that looks like this which is a standard replicated dynamic equation by which the, trait, the, 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 the relative success of families of type 1 compared to families of type 2 are endogenous and related to the paternalistic motives of parents to transmit their traits rather than seeing the traits of their, of their kids being adopted uh, from the other side. Yes? So in the previous slide, when the paternalistic motive operates, uh, so the parents are looking at the future So normally, yes. So this is a question. Normally, yes. The problem with that is that if you do that, and we have a paper where we do that with Alberto, you bring in some forward-looking kind of expectation dynamics. And that, we know, creates even more complexity. So without even that, so we're going to take them, like again, as being kind of myopic. Okay? So what comes up from this kind of uh, equation like this is a steady state. We described when G1 equals D2, the manifold of cultural steady states for a given structure of policies in the population if it were at the steady state itself, okay? Now, if you bring the two together, this is the, 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 what happens in terms of the full model, you have basically, for a system with two groups and two cultural traits, two dynamic equations. One, describing the evolution of the power of one group in terms of its own uh, structure and what is expected for the next period, and dynamics of culture for the two traits, which is kind of a, uh, a generalized replicated dynamics where the D here is determined endogenously and depends on, on policy outcomes and therefore on beta T plus one, okay? And you want to investigate the solution of that kind of system. And if you do that, well, you can show first that you have at least one steady state uh, and you do show a number of other features. If you specify a bit more the model uh, that you may have some, uh, you, have not, you, you may have some oscillations, but not, not convergent cycles, except if you have non-monotonicity in the policy, in policy function and a and bunch of, bunch of, of um, uh, implications. Okay. So, and you can do some comparative dynamics which relate to how the steady state vary with exogenous parameters and compare when they are complements versus when they are substitute. Now, uh, examples. I won't have much time to talk about examples. I'm just going to go sketch very quickly what is behind this, this example here, which is about extractive institutions, elite and bourgeois culture. So, of course, if Mike Kloske was in the room, she would probably jump at my throat because in a couple of equations, I'm going to summarize uh, uh, 2,000 two, two pages of, uh, of three volumes on, on the bourgeois society and, uh, and growth. So, but she's not around, so let me take the luxury to do that. So here, uh, you have an economy that is populated by mass of workers, 
proportion 1 minus lambda. And here, demographics will be constant, so that's going to be the same mass over time. Uh, and elite members, in proportion lambda. Okay. The, the, the preferences are the following. The mass care about labor supply, V, the supply AI, they are taxed at the rate P, okay? And this is their consumption, 1 minus P A1, the utility of this and the disutility of working. The elite is composed of two types of people, the bourgeois and the aristocrats. The bourgeois, they have this, the same preferences as the mass in terms of utility of work, right? The aristocrats, they don't like work. They have this fita, which is very large. So actually, they will never want to work. Uh, and they will basically, the, 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 the elite has some endowment, land, positive, and big enough. Uh, and, uh, and they receive the transfers that they extract from the mass. So this is extractive institution. So you tax the mass, and you extract revenue that you distribute to the elite. So this is T, OK? And you have a survival constraint. Consumption has to be larger than C bar. It's not going to be binding for the elite, but it might be eventually for the masses. Okay? So now, what will be the game? The game, as I said, the policy game in each period for each generation, you have this structure of power where the masses are reflected by the weight beta, the elite by the weight by 1 minus beta, and this is the average utility of the elite, where Q is the fraction of bourgeois, 1 minus Q the fraction of aristocrats, and this is basically what you look for the policy game objective function, policy of maker objective function, right? With the budget constraint of the government, the transfers given by the, to the elite depends on the tax revenue that you collect on the masses. Uh, uh, and you give it proportionally to the elite members, okay? Now, the, the elite, the mass, you have to compute also the behavior of the mass and the elite, right? In terms of effort to work. I told you that I'm going to frame the parameters such that the aristocrats won't work, so they will live on their rents. The bourgeois, they will work. They will work, but they will receive also a transfer because they are part of the bourgeoisie, and they, they exploit the masses. Uh, now, the masses, they basically get taxed. But they will be eventually in two regimes. One, which is what I call a non-extractive regime, where their survival constraint is not binding, and one in which they will be in a, in a, an extractive regime where they will be just at the limit of surviving, right? And that gives us the following shape of their effort to work as a function of the tax rate of the, of the elite. When they are non-extractive, you have the disincentive effect on labor supply, the usual one. So you tax more, people work less. But at some point, you tax so much that at some point, the guys get close to uh, the survival constraint. And the point where it gets to the survival constraint, if you tax him more, then what does he do? He wants to consume anyway C bar. So at this point, he starts to work more to consume the C bar to survive. So when you keep on taxing him more, then he increases labor supply, actually, on the opposite. Up to the moment where, of course, here he will die. But uh, we, stop, we will stop before he dies, OK? So the uh, uh, labor supply, actually, is not monotonically decreasing in the tax rate because of the survival constraint and in the extractive regime. Now, you can look for the solution of that game, which is the Nash equilibrium, which will be the solution of this. And that gives us a policy function at the Nash equilibrium of that game between the elite and the masses, right? And that will be declining in the weight of the masses. If the masses are more powerful, of course, in the policymaker objective, they, they matter more. So you want, they want to be less taxed. And it's going to depend also negatively on the fraction of bourgeois. Why? Because the, if you have more bourgeois, the bourgeois, they have a marginal utility of transfer, which is lower than the aristocrats. So in the optimal taxation game, if you have more bourgeois, there's less incentive to tax the masses and give to the, to the, to the elite. So that's why it's declining in, in beta and Q. Okay? This is what you get at the shape of the policy, the policy function in terms of the weight of the masses. Here, there are the survival constraints completely. They are get very, very taxed and they just consume C bar. And then they are still like taxed to the point where they will consume C bar, but they are, more, they are more powerful, so they tend to reduce still the amount of labor they want to furnish to consume that C bar because they don't like to work. And at this point, when they are powerful enough above that value, beta 0 Q, then the, the outcome will be that actually they are not anymore on the survival constraints. And then you have the standard type of uh, incentive constraint that you tax them more, they reduce their labor supply. Okay? So they are not anymore in the survival, here they are in the survival.
Okay. Now look at what will be the change of betas over time in that society. To look at this, as I say, we need to compute the same sort of equilibrium, but from the point of view of the Stackelberg leader, where now the policymaker decides the P, internalizing the effect of P on the labor supply of the masses, the labor supply of the elite, which are the, essentially the bourgeois, because the, work, the, the aristocrats don't work. So there, you have a new object, which is this policy vector, this policy, uh, the taxation rate as a function of commitment, uh, when you internalize the effect on the behavior of individuals, that depends on beta and Q. And it depends on beta and Q the same way, except that it looks like this, in blue. So what is intuition behind this? And then I'm going to stop. Uh, well, two slides more, and then I stop. Um, this is basically telling you here, in that part, remember here we are in the regime where there's no extraction. So the, the, the masses are not at the survival constraint, which means you have the standard disincentive of taxation on labor. Now, the policymaker, when he's a Stackelberg leader, internalizes this on the tax base. So essentially, he wants to tax optimally less than what is the equilibrium. So that's why the blue line is below the green one. Here in that region, there is extractive, extraction of the maximum to the survival constraint of the worker. Now, in that case, the incentive goes two ways. First, when you are in the equilibrium, you don't internalize that by increasing a little bit the tax rate, you increase labor supply. Because now the guy wants to survive more, so he furnishes more supply of labor. And therefore, you extract more from him. So because of this, you would like to have the the blue line above the green line. But there's another distortion, which is at the same time, you put the guy, the worker, on his survival constraint, which is not his optimal choice of labor supply. And that increases the more you put him on the survival constraint, more you distort his welfare, because he's away from his optimal behavior and more and more, which is not to go to that level. And therefore, at some level, the blue line goes beyond, below the, the green one. So in the end, what comes up in terms of equilibrium, the dynamics of, of the weights, if you want to, to, de to, to delegate those weights to, to, uh, over time in the institutional change, you have two types of uh, institutional uh, steady states. One in which you are in the extractive regime, where the elite taxes the masses to survival. The elite has a lot of power because beta is low, and that's it. Or you get to the point where the elite basically doesn't tax anything because, in a way, the power is in the hands of the masses. Beta is large enough that you have zero tax here. Okay? Now, you bring that with your model of cultural transmission, where uh, you uh, allow the trait to be bourgeois to be transmitted within the elite only. Okay? And bourgeois kids look at bourgeois models, and they look at aristocrat models, <coughs> And they decide whether or not they take one or the other. And there's socialization by parents in the usual way of business value. And what happens now, if you look at the cultural dynamics, is that, and which trait will evolve in the elite? You're going to have that, actually, the trait that's going to evolve more likely in the elite will be the trait of the, um, of the bourgeois, the ones that like to work. The less likely the elite is going to extract some rents from the masses. So in a sense, you have to come to the model, but uh, what happens here is that because of this paternalistic motive of parents to transmit or not their trade to their kids, uh, when you extract a lot of friends on the masses, the aristocrats are relatively more successful at transmitting their traits than bourgeois are at transmitting their own trade. So the trait of the aristocracy will increase in the population. Now, when is it that actually the, 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 the elite is extracting more from the, from the masses is exactly when the masses have no power. So when the masses have no power, the aristocracy trait is diffused more likely in the elite group. On the other hand, when the, 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 the masses have more power, there's less extraction of rents on them, and the elite trait is less likely to be diffused successfully in a society compared to the bourgeois trait. So now if you bring all this together, and that's going to be the end, you have this phase diagram. Change in the bourgeois trait in the elite population, power of the masses. And you have basically two, two steady states. 
One which is here, which is a, what we could call a Malthusian steady state with the extractive institutions. The elite have a lot of power. The masses have little power. The masses are just at the survival constraint, heavily taxed by the elite. And the, the aristocracy trait is widely diffused in the elite population. And actually, this is a situation of substability between culture and institutions because the two manifolds are crossing with different slopes. And you have eventually here some cycles or some oscillations. And you have this other situation in which if you have enough, you start with enough power to the masses or enough bourgeois trait in the society of the elite, the, the system goes to the other side. Namely, you give full power to the masses, no taxation on them, and you get to eventually a number of steady states here because at some point you don't change anymore the, the structure of power. Okay? All right. So out of this, you can do some comparative statistics and blah, blah, blah. So then I have here an example which is about property rights and the culture of violence. Uh, I will not go through it. And in terms of conclusions, uh, what we did here is just to present a, a setup, which is like a toolbox model that captures both institutional change and cultural change together. And in the particular examples, you can derive those complementarity versus stability, stability conditions. Uh, different other examples can be framed. We have some in the papers in terms of education, redistribution, work ethic, or public governance and civil culture. Uh, we are also working on the interaction of this kind of framework when you bring in religion into politics. So how religion brings eventually legitimacy and how it interacts with cultural change and institutional change. And of course, there's a bunch of issues that uh, we didn't deal with, but that will be certainly worth investigating in future research uh, for people that want to investigate that kind of area. Okay? Thank you. So I don't know. I mean, I'm uh, speaking under the authority, uh, the tight authority of uh, Tridip. So what about question? I mean, I think we are a little... Uh, five minutes question, so that's... It's good. I mean, it's certainly a short period given the, the richness of the talk and the, the model. So, uh, yeah, are there some questions about the... Yeah. You didn't mention trust anywhere. Uh, no, I, I didn't mention trust, uh, but you can think about having a model of trust in the same sort of way. You have to specify what will be the other in your model and what will be the policy that you have in mind. It, the, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the, the particular context in which you might think about trust in a public policy is the context of Aguillon and the co-offers of regulation and trust, uh, where they had this model, they have this, uh, with Aguillon, Cahuc, and um, co-offers, and Young and Algon, I think, where uh, they have a model, and they had some empirical analysis of how trust, and more trustworthy uh, populations uh, that tend to support less regulation. So uh, whether, uh, and, and, and it's not so obvious from the point of view of whether they are complements or substitutes, because you might say more you regulate, you might transmit more trust and the trust, uh, but you have the one side of the equation certainly that is substitute, which is when you have more trust, you're less, you have less demand for regulation. Uh, and so, uh, but that's, that's an example where if you think about the policy instrument as being regulation, and the cultural trade has been trust in the society, you could frame a model that goes along those lines that, that could be done. With this uh, model, you have this, you have this fictional policymaker who has these weights, right? And that's some kind of shorthand for a game between the different groups. Yeah, yeah that's right. So supposing you were to model that explicitly, how would that change things? Because it seems to me this is really, you really do want to do that, right? I mean, because yeah. in actuality, it's not, there is no one, there's no one with these weights. It's, a, it's you're, you're describing those weights as some kind of shorthand for the outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the weights actually are shorthand for the way through which you, there is some effective decision rights in the political process. Uh, that's basically the correspondence. Uh, now, how are they effectively implemented? Then, yes, you would need to have a game that tells you eventually because how the constraints you impose on people generate at the end an effective sort of decision rights reflected by those weights. I agree. And that, that's, that's, uh, that. now the, the, the advantage of this is, of course, the tractability that you deal with two variables 
and you have basically a, a setup where institutions are changed continuously. This is another feature as well, which is that we are so we're low here for incremental institutional change over time. Uh, while if you take most of the literature, it's very much discrete choice. You have democracy, non-democracy, dictatorship, non-dictatorship, or you, uh, whether this is the right model or the other model uh, depends very much on what you think in terms of what is relevant for institutional change. Uh, for instance, there is a, there is a very uh, sociology literature which is exactly about that, about incremental institutional changes, Maone and others. The example they mentioned typically is how the Chamber of Lords in England, which initially was an instrument to control the king, and basically therefore associated to an elite, over time changed its structure of decision rights to now reflect only the symbol of democracy in England. Uh, which is kind of paradoxical because they, they, they evacuated all the time uh, their, their power making uh, their, 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 their decision rights in terms of policy. And it was like through a, make a number of incremental changes in the way agenda setting and committees were designed and so forth. So now, one way to bring back the discontinuity would be to say here, I assume that the groups, when they make this collective decision making process, they agree to be in that game. They agree to be in that particular setup, right? But in fact, they have reservation constraints, which is, look, this is what I get with the current, because here the policymaker is aggregating everything. But normally, each group will have his own reservation constraints, which is, with those weights, this is what I get. And if I don't get this, the alternative will be I get to war, or I get to revolution. And then I get eventually some bad outcome somewhere else. So then you will have some reservation utilities. So what will happen in that case is that the weight will move right, to the moment where you get binding to one of the two or the three or the four groups. And at this point, the model doesn't say what's going to happen. If you, if you, you, the model says you're going to get stopped there. That's it, finished. And of course, it, it, there are other forces which are, but you need to bring in that case conflict technologies and stuff, which allows you to say what will happen in the, on, the, on the, the, the side paths of, of this alternative. So which makes the model eventually more complicated and less tractable. But I agree that in the micro foundations, you will need to have uh, that, that, cut, that covers somehow uh, more complex kind of strategic interactions. OK, so I mean, I three dip is a little. Perhaps you want uh, Hoidi to make yes, the last one, and then I'll. So if lambda is really small, lambda is how much you care about the workers, I, or is it the flip of that? The beta, uh, the lambda is the size of the, the masses. Of the masses. Oh. Oh, the beta so how much you care about the, the, masses. The, the masses? And so if that goes to zero, it, then do you ever delegate? And so again, I, it, it was related to this because can you then think of uh, lambda coming out of some other system it could be the judicial system, or it could be conflict, or it could be someone just taking revenge on you or something that is outside the model. So basically, someone can do something very bad to you if you don't care about them at all. Uh, is that how you're thinking about it? Well, no, uh, what happens here is that essentially the reason why beta and equilibrium in the city doesn't go to zero is because even, even when it's very close to zero, uh, from the point of view, if it's zero, yes, there's a, there's a determinacy. But if it's not exactly zero, uh, what happens is that uh, the, 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 the elite that cares, or the policymaker that cares almost only about the elite, still understand that there's a, there's a little gain in terms of the externality that the policy game doesn't internalize. So they want to give a little bit of power to the masses because the masses then will want to reduce a bit the tax rate, which will improve somehow the, ag the aggregate thing. Of course, if beta equals zero, you don't even care about that. But if beta is not exactly equal to zero, that's why it's unstable, uh, you, will, you will care a little bit for that. And then for the process, because this is myopic, if it was not myopic, probably, yes, the elite will stop and will, will be stuck to zero because of this. But, uh, but otherwise, if it's, it's because of myopia, uh, a little perturbation on the beta close to zero makes actually the power of the, of the, of the masses to grow not that much, but to be strictly positive inside this uh, Malthusian uh, long-run long city state.
So we really need to stop now. And so we would like to thank again. Uh, Yeah, so let's, uh, so we uh, now run 15 minutes late.